<laughs> and we're live. All right, welcome everybody to the Breakthrough Guitar Top 10 Q&A Live. My name is Brock. This is my partner in crime, Jonathan. How you doing, Jonathan? What's up? We're doing good. Ready to do some Top 10. Yeah, man, we got some good questions for you today. If you guys are here live, welcome. Thank you for showing up live. If you're watching the replay, that's cool too. Uh, just let us know in the comments um, if you have any questions that you want to be asked in the future. Uh, but if you're watching on Facebook and or YouTube, make sure you, that you follow the channel. Uh, you like, subscribe, all that good stuff so that you never miss another notification. I have to stop hitting my desk because <laughs> it shakes like that. Okay, cool. All right, guys. So we're going to jump in. We're, we got some really great questions. I got 10 questions lined up that have been asked by some community members. Uh, some team members, some people that are, are in the Breakthrough Guitar community. But I will start by saying, if you don't know what Breakthrough Guitar is, I think it's one of the best guitar learning platforms in the world online, definitely, for sure. Um, we've, we have thousands and thousands of students. Over 700,000 students have jumped in on Breakthrough Guitar, which is a lot of students. Um, but people have had amazing breakthroughs with their with learning and discovering what's inside them and being able to express that music on uh the guitar so um we're gonna jump into some questions are you ready for them jonathan i'm ready man let's get warmed up right okay the first question that we're gonna ask is how do i become a guitarist like eric clapton or john mayer so that's the question how do i become a guitarist like eric clapton or john mayer okay so i think there's a couple of different ways that this question can go and one can be let's break it apart one can be how do I become a guitarist, right? Uh, versus maybe somebody who just plays guitar or somebody who can just pick up the guitar and maybe play a few bits and pieces of songs or you know something around a campfire like that. How do you actually go from that to be able to just play a few things on the guitar to becoming a guitarist? And then we'll talk about, I'll answer that, and then we'll talk about how do you become somebody like Eric Clapton um, or you know John Mayer or somebody like that. And when I mean how do you become somebody like them, I mean how do you start to play like them, not necessarily how do you have a bunch of albums and go tour on the road and be really famous, right? That's not what we're talking about. So how do you go from being a guy who just kind of messes around on the guitar to actually being a guitarist? And I think the real question here is how do you go from just a guitar player or just somebody who kind of picks up the guitar to a musician? And that's the real question. So... What most people don't understand is that, in fact, I did this you know, for years, but most aspiring guitar players, when they go out there on YouTube, you know, they watch a ton of videos or they read articles online or you know, uh, buy a bunch of books or videos or something like that, and most guitar players, uh, aspiring guitar players are out there trying to learn, and most of the teachers are out there teaching them stuff about the guitar. So... The, all the, the aspiring guitar players are going out there and they're trying to learn the guitar. Meaning they're learning like, here's this pattern, here's this one scale pattern, or here's this one chord shape, or here's this one thing on the guitar. But the problem is, when you're thinking that you're going out there and you're trying to learn, quote, the instrument, the guitar, it actually takes you away from being able to become a musician and being able to express yourself on the instrument. Why? Because the goal is not to learn the guitar itself. The goal is to be able to learn music on the guitar. And most people never really connect that until somebody points it out to them. So what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is understanding and learning how music works itself before you ever apply it to an instrument, right? And I don't mean going out there and studying music theory for a bunch of years. That's never going to do anything for anybody. Um, except make you book smart, but nobody cares how much you know about books, like guitar theory books, they care about how much you can play the thing, right? They just want to hear you play the thing, and, and that's all that really matters. So my point is, by changing the way you think about when you pick up the guitar and play it, to changing it from, I'm going to learn something about this guitar, to now I'm going to learn something about music, and expressing myself in music, I'm just going to do it with the guitar. I'm just going to do it on the guitar, okay? So how do you do that? Well, uh, that's the reason why we have specifically a course called Guitar Grid Mastery, which the point of it is, yes, the guitar grid itself will tell you uh, how to easily hit all the right notes in any key, but that's not the point. The point I'm getting at is, by doing that process, you will actually discover how to start playing music 
on the guitar. It teaches you how music works just applied to the guitar. And you'll be able to see past the guitar itself and you'll be able to see maybe other instruments. You will, you'll be able to hear like a saxophone or a singer or something and you'll be able to connect the dots with your ear about what they're doing musically not necessarily just applied to the guitar. Okay, So that's step one. Step one is to change the way you think about approaching playing the guitar. You're not trying to learn the guitar. Yes, you physically have to navigate the guitar, but the goal is that you're trying to learn music. Okay, And when you learn music, that's how you can become a musician and then therefore play any instrument. Music itself is a language. And once you learn the language, you can play any instrument. It's exactly the same as the English language. Once you learn how the English language works, well, you can pick up a pen and write in English. You can go to a computer and you can type in English. I can talk to you right now in English using my voice. All of those are different instruments, right? So the point is, learn music, not the guitar. Learn how, to, how, how music works and learn how to play music and express yourself through music, and you can simply use the guitar to express that music. Um, you know that that's coming through you that's flowing through you but you'll also be able to play other instruments as well so that's part one part one is focus on becoming a musician not just somebody who can play a few things on the guitar okay that's step one the second step is people like Eric Clapton and John Mayer the original question was you know how can you start playing like those guys well there's a few key steps and I'm gonna make it very very general right there's a lot of details but let's make it very general step by step so first of all, you gotta, you gotta be inspired by something to want to be able to play the guitar. So Eric Clapton, for example, John Mayer, for example, uh, me, for example, pretty much all the great guitar players in history, they had examples or they had other role models or other you know, musicians that they really liked that they modeled, that they liked to play like, right? They start to take their musical ideas. They listen to, for example, I would used to listen to B.B. King songs and try to play like B.B. King, right? Now my goal wasn't to become B.B. King, my goal was to play what I wanted to play. It just so happened at that time, I was really into B.B. King, I was, I was really getting down his phrasing style, the way that he played notes, and I would add those tools to my backpack so I can later you know, create and develop my own style. Now, you, once you, John Mayer and Eric Clapton, and again, all the, the other guitar greats did the same thing, but let's uh, specifically focus on those two players the process that I just mentioned with me going to listen to B.B. King and taking some of what B.B. King did and mimicking it and modeling it for myself and then eventually later being able to change it to my own style, you simply follow that same process over and over and over again with the different guitar players that you really like, that you really like to listen to. For example, if you really like B.B. Uh, King or John Lee Hooker or Eric Clapton or whoever it is, over time when you dive deep into each one of these guitar players and you really study what are they doing uh, the first part is that you want to learn how music works right so you can have a context so you know what they're doing it's just like learning the English language so that when you go to these other musicians you can understand what they're saying with their music now let's say somebody like Eric Clapton or John Mayer once they have studied and copied and modeled a few different artists that they really like well, naturally, their own style starts to emerge because they have their own preferences. They have their own preferences of what do they want to hear? You know, what sounds do they already hear in their head? How do they want to bend the note? How do they want to slide the note? Everybody has their own different unique way of wanting to express themselves. You just can't do that until you uh, start to use the techniques and until you start to see the musical ideas that other great players have used before. And that's how you discover new ideas. It's exactly the same thing as reading a book. When you read a book, you read somebody else's ideas that you've probably never thought about before. And you can add those ideas into your brain, right? Into your repertoire, I guess, of things that you know about. It's exactly the same thing in music. In music, you just listen to other artists play things that, that you haven't played before, or maybe you haven't thought about before, and you start to understand how they see the instrument, how they approach the instrument, and you hear the things that they have to say on their guitar. I always say, it's not about what you play. Like, we can look at a guitar player and they play a zillion notes, but we're like, yeah, so what? But then there are those guitar players, like John Mayer or Eric Clapton, who play just a couple of notes, two or three notes, four or five notes, and you want to cry, right? Why? Because it's not about what you play, it's about what you say. So anyway, my point is, once you find a few different artists that you copy and model, and over time, your own unique style starts to emerge because you start to be able to naturally 
express your, your own music that's in here and that's in here yourself, then you start to become someone like Eric Clapton or John Mayer with your own style. And again, at the end of the day, what those guys are doing is they're taking the music that's in their head and they're singing it through their guitar. Like I said, it's not about what you play. It's not about how flashy it is or how fancy it is. It's about what you say. Just like in English, when you hear somebody talking and they're saying something very meaningful, it's exactly the same thing in music. Yeah, that's a brilliant. Great answer. So, All right, all right. Hey, thanks, Vol, for hopping on live. He said, it's not what you play, it's what you say. Yes, sir. That's it. Words to live by. We should get that on a t-shirt, actually. <laughs> actually, that's, that's a good shirt. It's not what you play, it's what you say. All right. There you go. Cool. All right, let's jump into the next question. What kind of practice r routine would you recommend daily? Yeah, okay, so... When it comes to practice routines, first of all, I, I there's so many things to pick apart here because the word routine, right? Would you agree, Brock, that people are different? Everyone's different, yeah. Everyone's different, right? Some people, depending on their personality, love routine. And they strive, or they, excuse me, they, they thrive on having a daily routine of doing the same thing or very similar things. If you study personalities, other people, like myself, hate routines. I can't stand having to do the same thing over and over again. In fact, in my, you know, all the years of trying to figure out how to practice and all that and listening to all the gurus out there and all the, the advice that you hear all the time, which is like, you need to have a set schedule and sit down and practice this for 10 minutes and this for 20 minutes and that for 30 minutes. I literally could never, ever do that. I tried. I tried for a long time and I could never do that. So the first thing is to recognize what kind of personality do you have? Are you a person that likes to have routines? Are you a person that likes to sit down and do this and this and this and this and then do the same thing tomorrow, the same thing the next day? Or are you a person that kind of, you need to keep your interest up so you need to follow your curiosity or do something that is uh, you know, gonna interest you at the time, otherwise you just won't stick with it, right? I'm that kind of person, so I need to know that. That's the first step of determining your own practice routine. So I'm gonna kind of switch the question around here. The, the original question was, you know, what's a good practice routine to do daily? I'm going to answer that in a few parts. The first part is to recognize what kind of person you are, whether you like to do routine things or not. And when it comes to uh, what should you actually practice, well, you need to determine one thing first. What is it that you actually want to do on the guitar? So you need to spend some time thinking about what are your actual guitar playing goals? What do you want to achieve? What do you want to be able to pick up the guitar and do? For example, if one guitar player says, I want to be able to sit around a campfire and play Bob Dylan songs, and another guitar player says, I want to go on stage and play like Eric Clapton and play lead guitar and solos, well, those are two very different types of guitar playing, right? The first person might play an acoustic guitar, and they're probably only going to play chords, mostly what they call cowboy chords or open chords, like your general G, C, D, things like that, right? They may even sing. Whereas the person who wants to go on stage and play like Eric Clapton or play lead guitar or, or you know, improvise or something like that, well, they're going to be working on a completely different set of skills. More scales, more improvising, phrasing, uh, lead guitar, playing solos, things like that. Whereas the first person playing the acoustic guitar around a campfire is probably not almost ever going to touch that stuff if they don't want to, if that's not their goal. Okay. So we talked about two things so far. First is determine what your personality is. Do you Are you a person who likes routine or not? Do you thrive on having a routine or not? The second thing is determine what your goals are. What is it that you want to do on guitar? The third thing I would say, and obviously this is a loaded answer, right? It's not just a simple, here's the, the perfect practice routine. It doesn't work that way. And by the way, anybody you know that you've seen out there, we've all seen this, Anybody who, who can say, like, you know, here's your perfect practice routine, or here's what you should do every single day on guitar, you can't, it's impossible to give somebody a, uh, a recommendation like that, because it's just like going to the doctor's office. And if, if you imagine if you went to the doctor's office and they literally prescribed every single patient the exact same medicine, that's not going to work, right? It might even kill some people. You don't want to do that. And so, again, I, I kind of... Uh, Take that with a grain of salt, and you want to do some deeper thinking and, and deeper research when somebody t tells you that this is the thing, this is the practice routine or whatever it is. So, so far we have personality, second we have your goals, and then the third thing is, it's really about what is going to be 
in, in the there, there's four things. The third thing is you need to find some method or some guide or a person. It can be a mentor. It can be a course. It can be a book. Whatever it is, whatever it is that your that your goals are. Step number two, you need to find something that's going to guide you to get to those goals. So it's imagine if you have a ladder. If you're trying to get from the first floor, excuse me, from the ground floor to the first floor, and you don't have stairs or anything like that, you have to climb a ladder. Well, if you had a ladder that only had the sides, but it didn't have any rungs, you can't go anywhere. You can't climb up that ladder, right? You're going to stay on ground zero. But having a guide or having a, a mentor, a book, or a method or a process to reach the good, whatever guitar playing goal that you have is kind of like having rungs in that ladder. So you can take the first step, then the second step, then the third step, and eventually you will get to the next level when you follow that method, right? But it has to be the right method for you, and that's the important part has to be the right method based on your personality, based on what goals you want to achieve. So again, the third step is to have something, some kind of guidance or structure that gets you, that tells you the steps and guides you to get to those goals. Finally, we arrive at the practice routine. The, what, the fourth thing is, what should you practice? What should a daily practice routine look like? I always recommend something that I, that I like to call the two minute practice routine. The reason is because, not that I want somebody to practice for two minutes, right? That, that's not the goal. Obviously, more practice, if you know what you're doing, and if you do things in the right way, is going to lead to more results and faster results. But the thing is, most of us have a problem with knowing what to practice, or knowing that we want to pick up the guitar, we, we want to play the guitar well, but we just don't pick it up, or it just sits in the case, it just collects dust, right? What's the reason for that? It's not because you're not smart. It's not because you don't have a good work ethic. It's not because there's something wrong with your fingers or that you don't have talent or anything else that anybody else can tell you. Any of those myths about guitar that all the non-good guitar players just keep repeating because they don't know how it really works, right? It's not any of that stuff. The reason most people procrastinate when it comes to guitar playing is because they don't know exactly what they should do right there in that moment to get them towards their guitar playing goals. If they did, there wouldn't be any friction, there wouldn't be any procrastination, and they would be excited about doing it, and they wouldn't be able to wait to get home and pick up their guitar and play that thing because they know they're gonna get better when they do it, right? That's why this is so important to give, you know, I'm giving a long answer on what's a practice routine. Well, it, it depends, and it depends on what's your personality, it depends on everything else that we talked about, right? What's your personality? What is it that you want to achieve on guitar? Who is gonna guide you to get there? And then finally we arrive at the actual practice routine. I call it the two minute practice routine because everybody's busy. All I want you to do is once you find the method or the thing that's gonna tell you what you should do next, the only thing I want you to do on the practice routine is pick up your guitar. That's step one, pick up the guitar. Ask yourself, what do I want to improve most right now? Third step, do it. That's it, it's that simple. All you need to do is get started. It's like a car engine. You stick the key in the ignition and you turn it. How long do you leave the key in the ignition? Like how long do you turn the key? Until it starts, right? Once it's started, it runs on its own. Two minute practice routine is the same thing. Once you commit to yourself, you say, I'm gonna pick up the guitar for two minutes. I'm just gonna pick it up. That's like starting the engine. Once, the, once it's started, once you, once you have the guitar in your hands and when you know what to do, when you know what to do next and you know what goal you're trying to reach, Man, the car's gonna keep running and running and running and running, right? You don't have to supply any effort for that. So anyway, the whole question was, you know, what's what's a good daily practice routine? Well, it all boils down to, uh, really, the answer is it depends. And the real answer is, it depends on your personality, whether you like routines or not. It depends on what your guitar playing goals are. You need to determine that. It depends on uh, what what or who you have in place to help guide you toward those goals because you need the rungs and the ladder. You need somebody to tell you those things. Why? Because you don't know what you don't know. If you did know, you'd already be better by now. So you need somebody to guide you. It's just like having a coach. And then finally, the fourth thing is, I always recommend the two minute practice routine. Once you know what to do, once you know what your goals are, just say, I'm gonna pick up the guitar for two minutes. Work on the number one thing that you wanna get better at that day, and you will get better every single time you pick up the guitar. I love that two minute idea because it's, it's hard for some people to block off 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes. But if you just get into that habit of just picking it up for two minutes, right? That's, yeah. that's the, that's the biggest, that's the hardest part of the battle. I think is exactly. 
yeah, just picking it up. And that goes with you any. You need to start the engine. That's that goes with any like any skill or habit that you're wanting to build. You know, just getting like if someone. I was reading in Atomic Habits that you know there are some people that will. Uh, this one guy would spend. He would say, "I'll go. To, I'm going to the gym for five minutes, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And go for five minutes and leave. And he'd go for five minutes and leave. And go for five minutes and leave. And then eventually he's like, well, 'I'm already here. I guess I just keep working out, right? So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's good. Good stuff. Good stuff. I hope you guys are getting some value out of this. If you are, definitely hit the like button. Give us a heart, comment, all that good stuff. All right. Next question. Um, how long? I love these questions because <laughs> there, there's, you know, if there's open-ended answers and I'm, you never know what you're going to get. So how long does it take for you to feel like you are decent at playing songs and solos? Man, that's such a, it's such a personal question, right? How long does it take for you to feel good? Is, is that the question? Feel how good long does, yeah. How, did, how long does it make you, till you start feeling like you're, you're doing a good job with it? Basically. I see. Okay. So a lot of people ask questions and a lot of times this is these kinds of questions about how long is something going to take will come from a person who's more analytical who thinks like maybe an engineer or something like that who thinks about well I should be able to do this action and this action and this action and get this result by this time right and some things work that way like if you order a shelf from Amazon and you follow the instructions and you do step one step two and step three you're probably going to end up with a shelf if you follow the, the instructions, right? Guitar works the same way in terms of following instructions. Like when you have good instructions or good directions, you can follow it and build your skills to a certain point. But how long is it going to is it going to take? Is number one dependent on how soon you do it, like how fast you do it, and how far you're trying to go in that time period. But how happy you know you're going to feel with it, or when are you going to start to feel good with it? You know, that, that's that's more subjective. So I'll try to answer that the best I can. And it's really kind of a higher level answer, which is if, if any of you guys watching this are familiar with a guy named Tony Robbins. Uh, Tony Robbins is one of the, the you know all time greatest high performance coaches um, out there who who coaches people like the, the top athletes that you would know by name, um, even presidents of countries. He's a really, really he's really good at what he does. And what he always says is that happiness equals progress. Now, there may not be a point with your guitar playing where you're ever completely 100% satisfied, but that doesn't necessarily have to be a negative thing because not being completely satisfied means you always want to get better. There's always a drive to get better, right? But that doesn't mean that you're disappointed or sad with your guitar playing. Most people are, and that's just because they haven't figured out how to make progress. Remember, according to Tony Robbins, happiness equals progress. So there's t t kind of two answers here. So if you are wondering, you know, what, how long is it going to take? When are you going to be kind of happy? When are you going to feel good about your, your songs and your solos? Well, the first part is as long as you actually know what to do when you sit down with your guitar playing to reach a particular goal, like if, if there's a particular song you're trying to learn, or there's a particular solo you're trying to learn, you're starting from where you are and you're trying to get to being able to play that song or solo. If you know the right steps to take to be able to finally reach that goal, as long as you sit down with your guitar playing, when you, when you sit down and play and you actually make progress toward that goal, you're going to feel good every single time. Again, according to Tony Robbins, happiness equals progress, right? So as long as you make progress, you're going to feel happy over and over again with your guitar playing. Now, I mentioned the satisfaction part. We don't only want to play half a song or half a solo. Obviously, we want to play the whole thing, and then we want to play another one, then we want to play another one. So on one hand, it's good to never be satisfied with your playing because that, that means you want to keep getting better, right? The other part is, on a, on a bigger scale, when are you going to be completely satisfied You know, with, with the way that you play? And I think... It's, it's kind of hard to slice this up, but I will put it like this. The first part is, as long as you, you have a goal and you know what to do in order, like from step by step, to reach that goal, then that means that every single step, you're going to make progress and you're going to feel good about that, right? But let's zoom out a little more. And in the, in the overall journey of your guitar playing, when do you start to feel good about it? Well, I would say 
the very first time you play uh, your first whole song, it may not sound very great because you'll probably make mistakes and all that kind of stuff. And great, everybody makes mistakes every single time they play guitar, even if it sounds perfect, even the best guitar player in the world, okay? But the first time that you play a whole song from start to finish, that's an accomplishment. And the same thing is true for the first time you play a solo from start to finish, or at least a part of a solo from start to finish. Once you do that for the very first time, obviously it's progress, you're going to feel happy about it. But what's going to happen is, when you have learned to play something from start to finish, then you enter a new level, or you enter a new realm of playing music, which is called rehearsing. You can then rehearse. And when you rehearse, you play something over and over again. Most of the time it's start to finish, sometimes it's just working on one section of a song, for example. But like a band, for example, when you get to, together with a band and you rehearse songs, you go from start to finish, right? Because that's how music works. You hit the play button and you go until the end of the song. When you're able to do that, you're going to feel a new level of satisfaction with your playing because it's a new accomplishment. It's a new level that now I can learn whole songs. Now I can play whole songs. Now I can play whole solos. Now you reach a level where you can say, well, I can play more whole songs, more whole solos. I can play a whole album. I can play a whole set, right? It's a new level. But the thing is, the more you rehearse each one of those songs or each one of those solos, you're probably going to get a little bit better or maybe a little bit worse, which sounds weird, every single time. So your progress, your the, the ability that you have to play that one song or one solo over time probably goes up and down a little bit, but overall it goes up, meaning you're getting better at it. And your level of satisfaction increases with your ability, with your facility of playing that one song or that one solo, right? So it's a, it's kind of a gradual process that as long as you know what to do to make progress, you will feel happy and satisfied enough to like it, to have fun, to want to keep going. And you have to also realize that there isn't an end, right? This is a lifelong journey. So even the people who are miles and light years, at what you think is light years ahead of you on guitar right now, they still feel the same way. They can play what they can play. They're striving, they're striving to play something better and new and different, and it's a challenge. So that's, that's, always, that's part of the game. That's for the love of the game, right? You gotta love wanting to get better. But the whole point that I wanna point out right here is that I want you to focus daily, or whenever you pick up your guitar, I want you to focus on making progress that time. That's it, that's all you need to focus on. And all the rest will take care of itself. And a year goes by, you're gonna be so much better. Two years goes by, you won't even be able to recognize you're playing two years ago. Five years goes by, etc. cetera, you, you, you will become a great guitar player just by following that little bit of progress every single day. Yeah, I also think it's important to like give your let yourself realize that you just accomplished something, like little victories, right? So if you're brand new at learning guitar and you've never learned a song before, it's a big deal to even just sit down and look at you know uh, tabs or or chords and play through a song, like just staring at the music. That's a big deal for a lot of people. Um, or getting through a song without making a mistake, that is a big deal. And I think you should champion yourself on like, hey, mm -hmm. I've done something that other people can't do. This is progress right that's a big deal yeah it's it, it's mainly can i do more than i could do yesterday exactly and if you did you won the day that's it yeah that's awesome rock and roll cool all right so <laughs> next question thank you eli for hopping on thank you i see you in the chat thank you eli all right here we go anthony asks how do you know what fingers to use on the fretboard hmm, okay how do you know what fingers to use well it depends on what you're trying to do I will say this first that there are guitar players with less than the finger less than the number of fingers that you have, right? So they don't have a choice. Some people like Django Reinhardt, for example, had two fingers and he was an amazing jazz guitar player. There's another guy, I want you to look them and when you have some time, go to YouTube and look him up. His name is Mark Goffany. He doesn't have arms. Okay, this guy has no arms. He plays guitar with his feet. So first of all, if you even have fingers, you have no excuse. You can get really good on guitar, okay? Just by having fingers, you're already a leg up from the guy who has no arms, right? Or doesn't have all of his fingers. So which fingers should you use? I mean, again, it really depends on what is it that you're trying to do. I will encourage you to, to develop the ability to use all of your fingers. A lot of people, uh, Eric Clapton included actually, doesn't use their pinky a lot or at all. So a lot of people just play with these three fingers right here and they try not to use their pinky. Can you get really good like that? Yes. But will you be limited? Yes. It's really just a personal choice. I would encourage you to 
develop the facility of all of your fingers. Now, when I move my when I move my hand across the fretboard like this, it looks like I could always do this, right? It looks like I, I was born being able to do that, or it just looks effortless and all that kind of stuff. But the the it is now. But the only reason that's true is because I developed the ability to do that, right? I used to not use my pinky either until I had a teacher who pointed this out to me that you should really develop your ability to use your pinky because think about it, it's one more finger. If I play some chord that looks like this, well, if I don't use my pinky, well, I can't do anything else with this chord. I, I have to keep all these other fingers on the fretboard, but if I have my pinky, I can move it over here, over here, over here, over here, anywhere, right? There's so many different more combinations that you can do if you use all of your fingers. When it comes to playing scales, for example, um, you know, there's there's a lot of systems out there, there's a lot of uh, preferences, etc. depending on how you navigate the fretboard. The way that we teach to navigate the fretboard, I do recommend that you use your all, all four of your fingers, right? And when you make these really big stretches, I recommend that you use your first finger, your middle finger, and then your pinky. And you're gonna use your ring finger for other things. Now, I'm not being specific on purpose because, again, every situation is different. The, the point is that you want to be able to develop your ability to use all of your fingers. And this is specifically why we developed a program called Unlimited Dexterity. And I don't say that lightly. When we say Unlimited Dexterity, we, we mean that once you follow these exercises, it's kind of like going to a gym. And when you go to the gym, you work out your body, right? You have a personal trainer. The, the personal trainer may say, I want you to do, you know, 10 arm curls. Then I want you to do, uh, you know, five or 10 barbell push-ups or, or whatever it is. There's all different kind of exercises. The point is, most people don't see that the pros, the reason their fingers can move around the fretboard like this is because they basically go to the gym for their fingers. They work out their fingers to be able to move around. It's not just, it, it's not just like that. And if your fingers are, are stiff, or maybe you, you think your fingers are too big or the wrong size, none of that is true. It's just that you haven't got your fingers yet in shape to be able to stretch and to be able to make the, the movements uh, necessary, and you absolutely can. Now, like I said, that's why we developed a program called Unlimited Dexterity, because it's a stair-step program of 10 different exercises that start off really easily, and once you do the first one, you increase your ability a little bit. Then you go to the second one, which is a little bit harder. You increase your ab ability a little bit more. Then you go to the third one, a little bit harder. And you keep walking up these stairs, level one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten. By the time you get to level 10 and you do that exercise, you will be able to do this on the guitar neck, okay? It's impossible not to. It's simple physics. It's the law of cause and effect. If you walk up the stairs, you're going to reach the next level. It's just how it works. So that's what I would say about which, you know, knowing which fingers to use when you play the guitar. Awesome. Hey, I just want to shout out uh, Aaron. Thank you for showing up live. He said this is great. What's up, Aaron? We got Eli says this is helping me so much. Thank you. Hey, thank you guys. You guys rock. Appreciate it, Eli. Thanks for yeah. tuning in, man. If you guys have any more questions, please let us know in the chat because this is all just to help you guys. If, if we don't know what you ask, we don't know what to answer. It's like walking upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here we go. All right, when strumming on guitar, how do I stop hitting other strings when I play? So I'm assuming that the question is, how do I stop hitting other strings when I play? And if you can zoom out a little bit, Brock, so we can see the guitar here. Let me see if I can play this way. I don't have my normal headless guitar, so this is, this is odd. Um, let's say if I'm going to play a bar chord with all the strings, I'm going to play all the strings like that. But I'm assuming that somebody is asking, how do I miss some of the other strings if I'm not if I'm playing a chord that you know doesn't incorporate all the strings? Let's say I'm gonna play an open D chord, okay? I'm gonna get a little bit closer so we can see hopefully my fretting hand, or excuse me, my picking hand here. And I gotta pick the guitar way up. Let's see. So I'll just strum here. So if I'm gonna play a D chord like this, well a D chord in general you would only play from the D string, this string right here, down. So you're only going to strum from here down. If I play the other two strings up here, or down here technically if we're talking about uh, pitch, it's going to sound like this. Doesn't sound very good, right? So I assume that's what, that's what the question is about. How do I miss the other strings? Well, I want you to not be afraid of making things too simple. 
we want it to be extremely, extremely simple. So if you can ask yourself, well, what's the easiest way to only hit the right strings? Well, literally make the chord, look at the strings, put your pick or your, or your fingers on the strings that you're going to strum and strum it. And that's it. Do that. Then do it again. Then do it again. Then do it again. What you're going to do is you're going to train your picking hand to only go up the strings as far as they need to go to strum the right strings. And over time, it's just like tying your shoes. Can you tie your shoes without having to think about it? Can you tie your shoes like by you know looking around the room or, or, or whatever it is or talking to somebody? You can. And the same thing is true with driving. When you drive in your car and you drive to the same place a lot, you don't even think about it. Heck, most of us probably don't even know how we ended up you know, somewhere when we, when we drive. Uh, we go to the grocery store, we go to a friend's house or something, and we arrive there and we're like, shoot, I don't even remember driving here, right? It's an, it becomes an automatic process. So in terms of playing chords and missing the strings that you're not supposed to hit and only playing the strings that you are supposed to hit, it's exactly the same. It's, 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 it's the same automatic process, just like driving to your friend's house. But to start it, you have to be deliberate and intentional about it. And again, don't be afraid to make it too simple. You don't have to walk out there the very first day you learn a new chord and act like you're trying to play on stage in front of a million people and if you mess up, oh my gosh, it's so terrible. Who cares? Take it slow, this slow. Like this is ridiculously, painfully slow, right? Here's my pick, here's my D chord. I'm gonna take my pick, put it on the D note, and I know I'm not going to strum these strings right here. So I'm just going to do this. And I'm going to do it again. And again. And then after a while, especially when you rest your picking hand on your strings or you touch your strings, you can kind of feel well where you are in relation to the other strings. But the point is over time you get used to it. And once you do it really painfully slow, um, and, and deliberately for a few times you start to get used to it and then you can start to look at your fretting hand or you can start to look somewhere else and then practice only hitting the right strings like this and you will get it and literally it really is that simple and you just keep doing it over and over and over and over again and then before you know it playing a chord and hitting the right strings will literally just be as easy as tying your shoes you don't think about it. Your hand just does it automatically, and the right sort, the right chord comes out. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, Eli says he's going to try the dexterity lesson soon too, so that's good stuff. Yeah, those are really going to help, man. Actually, anything that you play, no matter what your guitar playing goals are, increasing your dexterity is kind of like uh, getting stronger in the gym. It's going to help with every single sport that you play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, here's the next question. I like to play the backing tracks on YouTube, but sometimes they uh, show recommended modes. What are modes and how do I use them? <laughs> what are modes? Okay, so there's two different, um, I think there's two different questions here. Or at least I would like to address two different questions. First question is, or the first topic is backing tracks. So what is a backing track? A backing track is a track, a musical track that you put on in the background that you then play over or you play on top of, right? So most of the time, uh, backing tracks will have like recommended scales or recommended chord charts or something like that. In the very beginning of learning how to play with backing tracks, that can be helpful because it can give you a starting point. But ultimately, it's just like training wheels on your bicycle. It becomes a crutch and you need to be able to balance on your own. Okay, You need to be able to, to balance on your own. Once you go through you know, learning how the scales work on the guitar, of course, our version of doing that is what's called the guitar grid. I personally think it's the simplest method I've ever heard of um, because you could take one pattern, literally one pattern. It happens to be seven strings, which throws people off at first because it's like, what are you talking about? The guitar only has six strings. But it happens to, it just happens to be that once you take all the theory out there and all the scales and you put it all together, that it actually all boils down to one pattern. Just like on a piano, a piano is the same repeating pattern over and over again. There's that same pattern on the guitar neck it just happens to occur across seven strings. So you have to see, you have to be able to, to think about, well, how does this work with an invisible string? And that same pattern repeats all over the guitar neck. My point is, that's the easiest way I've ever heard of to be able to know how do you play across the neck and hit all the right notes and not have to think about it. So that leads us to the question about modes. 
what are modes? Well, most people, when you go out there and you type in modes and or you, you read a book or something like that, uh, there's not a definite answer that people will give you. They, they will just tell you what to do or they'll show you something. And most of the time it's different. For example, um, if I say, I don't want to get too technical with this, but if somebody says we're going to play in the key of G and they're going to give you some scales in the key of G, right? Well, they will say that if you start on a G note and you play a G a major scale, well, it's a G major scale. And then if you take a, a, for example, in a book, you can open a theory book, and I've literally seen some theory books do this, where it will give you the notes of a G major scale, and let's just make this, um, let's make this very simple just for the sake of discussion. Let's assume that the notes in a scale are A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay, let's just assume that. They will give you a musical staff or they will tell you that, hey, mode number one is this, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And then they'll give you another musical staff below that and say, here's mode number two, or they have some crazy name, you know, like Aeolian or all those, all those crazy names that almost nobody has really any idea where it came from or what it means, right? That's not important. I'm just saying that when you go out there and try to learn all this stuff, it's very confusing. So if going back to the book, they'll give you the second staff, and it will just start at the second note, of the the first scale that they gave you so instead of being a b c d e f g it will be you know they'll skip the a and it'll be b c d e f g and then a is at the end of it and then they will go down to the next one and then they'll start at c and they'll go down to the next one and they'll start at d they'll go down to the next one and they'll start at e and by the time you read all this you're like you can see the pattern that they're doing that they're just starting with the next note but that doesn't tell you anything it doesn't like it doesn't let me pick up my guitar and do something with it right so and when it comes to modes, I really don't, <laughs> to be honest, I really don't recommend that most people go out there and Google like what is modes and, and try to figure it out on their own because they will get very confused because of what I just said about the books. If you were even trying to follow me with what I said about A, B, C, D, E, F, G, B, C, blah, 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 it's probably confusing. That's because it's confusing, right? And that's why it doesn't work. And that's why you can't play anything with it. But there's so many different versions of what people say about what modes are that it's just going to confuse you. We have one video that shows you what is mo where does a mode come from? What is it? What I like to say is a mode, I want you to think about this very, very simplis uh, simplistically, okay? Let's forget about all the theory. Let's forget about all the names of the notes. Let's forget about all that stuff like the word mixolydian and all that kind of stuff, right? Let's just forget about it. A mode is a mood. I'll say that again. A mode, you can think about a mode like a mood. And when I say mood, I mean like a different mood of a, like a, of a scene of a movie, like a different theme of a movie. What's the mood when uh, you're watching a movie about golf and a guy hits a hole in one and everybody's cheering? The music's going to be pretty happy, right? That's the mood. What's, what's going to be the mood when you're watching a horror movie and the guy with the butcher knife is outside the window? It's going to be a completely different feeling, right? A completely different mood. Playing in different modes simply gives you different moods. Okay, it's like different scenes in a movie. Now, that's really all that is. That's all as it relates to layman's terms, like humans, of, of how we can understand things. That's really all it is, and that's what it will allow you to do. Playing in a different mode will allow you to change the mood of what you're playing. Okay, I'll give you an example in just a second, but I don't want to go super deep into this because we don't want to have a huge long modes lesson. I just want you to finally grasp what modes are and why are they useful. Okay, now I just said that a mode is a mood and that when you play in different modes, it gives you a different mood or a different scene in a movie. The next question is, what creates those different moods? It's simply as it's, it's it's as simple as this. You're playing a pattern of notes that gives you a particular sound. That's it. What I mean is, when somebody says, "Hey, you're going to play the Mixolydian scale or the Mixolydian mode," or you're going to play the Dorian mode or the Dorian scale, all that refers to is a certain combination of notes 
that are certain distances apart from each other that just happens to create a particular mood. That's it. Now let me give you an example of this. So let's say I'm going to play this A chord. Can you, let me know if you can hear this, Brock. Yep, I'm good. Okay. So this is an A chord. If I wanted to play something that sounded happy, I can play an A major scale. Now it doesn't matter about what I call it, just listen to this. Sounds pretty happy, right? Generally happy, uplifting, etc. Now what if I wanted to change the mood? This is A major, what I just played. The name of that mode, or the name of that mood, which is happy, would be called Ionian. Just because they have some fancy word name Ionian, that confuses so many people. Just throw it away. You don't need it, it doesn't matter. You just need to know what it is, right? What if I wanted to now play a sad mood? Well, it just so happens that when I take this mode and use these certain combinations of notes called Aeolian, or AKA the minor scale, it just so happens to sound sad. So now, instead of playing this happy mood, I can now play a sad mood. This is an A minor chord. Listen to this. Totally different mood, right? The reason it creates a different mood is because I played a different combination of notes. That's it. That's the only thing you need to know. Let me do a couple more just so you guys can kind of get more of a glimpse into this. But um, I recommend again to well, I'll tell you the recommendation in a second. Let me finish this. Let's say we wanted to change the mood again. So some people hear, hear terms like Dorian, right? What does that mean? Well, let me play a Dorian mood for you and let's see what it sounds like. So let's go. What is that? How does that feel? You know, kind of sad, kind of melancholic, but in this weird place. Somebody's like in a mood, right? In, in, in a in a weird mood. Maybe they're angry. Maybe they're kind of sad. You can't really tell. It's kind of it's kind of um, melancholic, but it's not like desperate, right? This would be something that's desperate. That's like, oh my gosh. That's like, wow, what just happened? So let's do another one. Um, and by the way, I'm not trying to play something fancy. I'm just hitting some notes so you guys can hear what these moods sound like, right? Let's do another popular one, what's called Mixolydian. So if I play this chord, this might be if you guys, any of you Doobie Brothers fans or especially Allman Brothers, like those kind of bands will use these kind of moods a lot. And that's what gives a lot of bands or guitar players their signature sound, okay? So if I play something Mixolydian, it's gonna sound like this. jam band vibe you know it kind of has that mood to it so the point is again it's not that I'm trying to play a bunch of notes and you know look fl flashy or anything like that it's just that I'm trying to give you guys an example of what these moods sound like so what, what have we talked about so far what is a mode a mode in layman's terms is simply a different mood it's a different theme it's a different scene in a movie right like the soundtrack that's how you can think about it what's the scene well what does what soundtrack matches that scene in reality the reason that we get those different moods or those different sound themes whenever we play is literally because we're playing a different combination of notes. If you want to go deeper into modes, again, like I said, we have a whole 30 minute, 40 minute long video about how you can play all the modes anywhere on the neck. And we actually have a course called Total Modal Mastery where we go deep into all this stuff so you can play any mood at any time anywhere on the guitar neck. And it's really simple to do. It's just more than we have time for right now. So hopefully that gives you an overview of what the heck is a mode and what do I do with it? Yeah, that was a brilliant answer. Thank you for that. Jay actually said modes make so much sense and are easy to apply after you finish the guitar grid mastery course. So Awesome. Yeah. That's great, Jay. Yeah, it's so simple, man. And, and that's the I want to make a point about that too, that like, you know, with what Jay just said, it makes so much sense after the guitar grid mastery course. Well, guys, all this stuff is so simple. At the end of the day, it's so simple. The reason it seems so complicated and like you have to have a PhD in music theory or be Einstein to understand it all, 
the only reason it seems like that is just because there's a zillion books and videos and stuff out there a lot of most of which is just really bad and boring and they're all a little bit different so it makes it seem like there's a billion pieces to this puzzle when there's really only like five right when you put together those five pieces it's like oh wow this makes so much sense in fact there are so many guitar players that actually laugh out loud when they finally see how simple it is, right? When they get the, the freedom key system, the guitar grid, it's okay. so simple. So anyway, I just want to reiterate that because if you're out there struggling and if you're thinking like, gosh, I've been playing for so long, I, you know, I can't put it all together, uh, it doesn't all make sense, like I just want to encourage you that like it is really simple. And the reason you you probably feel like that is because you really are missing something that puts it all together, okay? Don't go out there and think that you have to practice for 15 hours a day for four lifetimes. Just just don't buy into that because it's just not true. You, We've all seen guitar players who get really good really, really fast. Well, they just know what to do, right? They get how it works. Yeah, awesome. I, I think this is a great time to talk about that if you guys have never dove into any of our courses before and you're interested in having that laugh out loud moment where you just like, man, this totally makes sense. This is, this is mm -hmm. really easy, which I've had that myself going through the courses. Um, definitely in the description of this video, there's a free a link to the free course called the Ultimate Lead Guitar Light Bulb Moment. Uh, it's definitely a great starter for if you wanted to see see what we're all about and see how you know how all this is. And we even have a free course. Uh, if you check out the playlist section uh, in our YouTube on our YouTube channel, um, there's a video version of that course as well. You can check that as too. So uh, definitely check it out. We we call it the light bulb moment. You know, it could be the laugh out loud moment, whatever it is. But um, yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Great, great, great answer. So makes modes sound more exciting. Yeah, because they are exciting <laughs> when, when they're not boring. Right? They're not boring. <laughs> uh, all right. So Chris, Chris asked this question. How do I reduce finger noise uh, while, say, playing, sliding my fingers from one chord to another? I can't get rid of the screeching sound. So I'm assuming that, uh, okay, so how do you, how do you minimize the, the finger noise? Um, and whenever you're playing, whenever you're sliding around, right? A lot of finger noise comes from playing an acoustic guitar. We've probably heard more finger noise coming from an acoustic. And the reason for that, like, honestly, the reason for all of this, it just boils down to very simple physics. Okay, there are things that you either do or you don't do that either make more sound or make less sound or make no sound. That's it, right? So there's only a few things you can do. First of all, if you never touch the strings, you're not going to make any string noise. But you got to touch the strings to play guitar, right? So um, if you are playing chords, let's say I'm going to play this chord here. And I'm going to see if we can make some, some finger noise. I don't know if we can. But if I can play this bar chord, this is a G bar chord, and I'm going to slide. Can't really hear. I don't know if you can hear that. It's very, very subtle. I have really thin strings on here. Um, but the one thing is, whenever you change chords, if you simply don't grab the neck as much, like if I if I hold the neck and the strings down, of course, if I play the chord and then try to slide, you're still going to hear the sound of the strings like this. You still hear the strings when I slide. But if I let off a little bit, the ring of the chord mutes itself like that, but you might still hear me sliding around, right? And if you want to reduce that, what you can do is simply let your fingers off the strings a little bit more but you're gonna have a downside of uh, potentially missing some notes when you go to the next chord because your fingers aren't gonna be on the right strings. So it's easy just to move like this without lifting your fingers off the strings because it makes your playing a little bit more accurate. Um, sometimes what people will do to mute uh, open strings is put like a headband or something right here whenever you're playing. You'll see a lot of like shred guys kind of do that. Uh, you know, I would be willing to bet that probably most people don't want to have a headband, you know, on their guitar while they're playing. Um, but another thing you can actually do is you learn how to mute the strings with your picking hand. So when you're playing, it, let's say I'm picking some of these strings like this, well, you can actually learn how to use your fingers or use your palm to mute some of the strings that you're not playing. Now, the question was specifically about finger noise whenever you're playing chords. So, again, you really only have so many options. You can either lift your fingers off the chord and move the chord, then press it down again. You won't have any string noise because your fingers aren't touching the string. But again, the downside of that is that your chords might be a little bit less accurate. 
So it's really just kind of a balance of, of what do you want to do. Another thing you can do, which is, uh, is just simply get thinner strings. The reason why you hear more acoustic uh, string noise is because the acoustic strings are generally thicker. And when you look at the wound strings, the winds on the strings are actually fatter. They're actually bigger than they are in electric strings. So when you have a bunch of, it's just like if you drive in a car, what are you going to feel more? A bunch of little tiny speed bumps like road paint lines or a bunch of speed bumps, right? Those bigger strings are like sliding your fingers on those big speed bumps. Therefore, it creates a lot more friction. You're going to hear it a lot more. But again, like it all just boils down to physics. You only have a few options. Either take your fingers off the strings to change the chords or just deal with it or get smaller strings. Um, there are also things you can use like in case your strings are old or dirty, it's gonna cause more friction, it's gonna be harder to slide, right? And that will create more noise. Um, so you can maybe change your strings, or they also make lubricant that you can use for your strings, or even you can get coated strings. Uh, what's that? There's one brand of coated strings that everybody used to love, Elixir. Elixir, yeah, yeah. You can get something like that, but you're still gonna have a little bit of string noise. My suggestion is just focus on what you want to play. The string noise will take care of itself. And a little bit of string noise when you're playing it actually sounds pretty cool, in my opinion. So yeah, I was I would even say that sometimes uh, the quality of your pickups, the amp, the pedals that you're using, how you, how you have your tone knobs positioned, there's like so many reasons totally. that you could be having screech screeching. I don't know if that's the I don't know if that's the best term for it, you know. But I mean, if, you, if you're having screeching, it might be that you just have some gain, too much gain on some pedals or something. I mean, yeah. if it's yeah. an electric guitar, yeah. Yeah. All right, we've got a couple questions left, but I feel like this is a great time to say if you are not subscribed to our YouTube channel, hit that like button, subscribe, <laughs> comment, let us know what you think about these Q and As, and Jonathan's uh, custom made guitar that he's he's holding. Right, you made that yourself, right? Yeah, this is an old one, man. I used to make all my guitars. I modeled this particular guitar off of um, Sean Lane's Vigier. If you don't know who Sean Lane is, I highly recommend that you check him out because, in my opinion. Probably one of the top three, at least top five greatest guitar players of all time. But anyway, that's why I have this guitar. And uh, this is what I always played whenever we played shows and recorded albums and things like that. I played this guitar. Nice. A lot of pickups on there. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right. We got another another question for you. We got three left. All right. I work long hours and love playing and learning guitar. Because of my work hours, I find that I just want to veg out and watch TV. How do you recommend I stay motivated to learn guitar? Like a lot of so, people relate to this one. Yeah, for sure. So like, shoot, how do you have time to play guitar? And basically the question is, you know, how do I, how do I stay motivated, but also how do I just have energy to play guitar, right? Uh, well, first of all, if you're trying to, if, if you need to come home after a long day's work and, you know, veg out on the TV and, and watch TV and just, just relax, first of all, you do need to relax. But second, you're probably choosing the, not, not the best time of the day to pick up your guitar and practice. Why not pick it up for five minutes, 10 minutes in the morning? when you're fresh, right? Because you, you have, uh, wake up five minutes, 10 minutes earlier, and I know that may be hard to do for some people, but it won't when you hear what I say in a second. But wake up a little bit earlier. Sit down when nobody's around, when it's very quiet, when you can focus, when you have a fresh head, even if you need some coffee, whatever, do that. Spend some time. If, if guitar is important to you, spend the time with it, do it. And, and wake up in the morning and, and try to focus on one thing that you can get better at that day and one thing that you enjoy doing, and then boom, you're gonna have a smile on your face, you're gonna be able to go off to work, do whatever you gotta do that day, and the whole day is gonna be better, because you already made time for you. And that's extremely, extremely important. Uh, the other thing is, as far as staying motivated, and what's gonna help you wake up earlier is, if you have a definite roadmap and a goal with your guitar playing, if you just kind of pick up your guitar and you hope to get better and you look at a few videos or books or whatever, you don't really you know, know what you're doing, you spin your wheels, you don't really get anywhere, you get frustrated, you're not gonna wanna do that again tomorrow and the next day and the next day. It's just gonna feel like crap. Like nobody wants to feel like that. It's not gonna motivate you to pick up the guitar. But if you have a dedicated goal, if you know where you're going and you have some kind of structure, some kind of guidance, some mentor or something to tell you step by step how to get there, well shoot, you're not gonna be able to wait to pick up your guitar, right? Even if you are tired, even if you can't sleep at night, it's midnight, two in the morning, you'll get up and play it, or you'll just reach over and grab it and start playing it. 
uh, which is a good tip, by the way. If you want to play with without looking, reach up, uh, reach over and grab your guitar when you're in bed, when you can't see anything. Then you can't look. So just try to play it like that because you'll really be listening. But anyway, as far as being motivated, again, it, it all comes down to having something to be motivated for, having something to get up for, having something, some reason to, to pick up your guitar. And again, if you have a goal, something that you want to achieve, even if it's playing your very first song from start to finish, even if it's being able to improvise over a certain track, even if it's being able to play a solo, a particular solo, etc., you need to have that destination. And you also need to have the second part, which is the, the steps, the guidance, the mentorship to help you get step by step to that goal. And when you have that, it's going to be so much easier to wake up five minutes earlier in the morning, 10 minutes earlier, 15 minutes earlier in the morning, because you know exactly what you're going to do. And you know when you do those things, you're going to make progress. You're going to feel happy. You're going to go through the rest of your day and be like, you know, beaming from ear to ear because, man, that was so fun. I can't wait to do it again. You may even decide to get a tiny guitar that you can take on your lunch break or something, like a Baby Taylor, for example. Those are amazing guitars. But anyway, uh, that's what I, re I would recommend. So if you if you don't feel motivated uh, and you, you just, you know, don't pick up your guitar, you, you feel too tired at the end of the day, flip it around. Focus on you first thing in the morning. Play guitar first thing in the morning and also make sure you have a goal and you have guidance on how to get to that goal and you will feel motivated, you will feel excited, and you will make more progress uh, probably than you have in a long time. Yeah, I always have the goal of reading, right? I was I like to read, but I, man, at the end of the day, when the kids are asleep and everyone, and last thing I want to do is sit down and read, but I'm like, oh, <laughs> I get tired or find an excuse. So what I started doing was early in the morning. That's, the, that's one of go. the first things I do. Or if I'm listening to an audio book, that's when I listen. So I make sure that I have, I have the rest of the day to make excuses. If I get it done early in the day, I can, tr you know, whatever. So, oh, by the way, on that note, it's just like they say in the airplane: if the oxygen mask comes down, put the oxygen on yourself first before you go out there and help other people, right? Before you put it on, put it on other people. That's good. So, that's your morning time. Yeah, focus on yourself first. I like it. All right, all right. Uh, two questions left. Aaron asks, how can I find vocal melodies when playing guitar? So I think he likes to play to, like like to play the, when he's playing with the band, he wants to play the vocal melody as well. How, how does he do that? So that's an interesting question. How do you, I'm assuming the question is, how do I know where to find, like maybe the music or tabs or something like that for the vocal melody? Um, I would, there's, there's generally not a lot of that available, but... First of all, I would say it's a great idea, and I suggest you practice it, to when you're playing the guitar, and especially if you're playing lead, to try to copy a vocalist. Because your guitar playing will develop a vocal quality to it, and that's really what makes people want to listen. Most of us love like a good singer that you really like. You really tune into it, right? It's great. It can move you to tears. And people like Eric Clapton, John Mayer, B.B. King, etc., all those great guitar players that can really move you with their guitar playing, it's because they have a vocal-like quality to their playing. It's, it's, it's that they're singing through their guitar. And first of all, I highly recommend that you work on that in general because your guitar playing will just sound better and it will be more fun uh, and more fulfilling when you play it. But in terms of how do you find you know vocal music uh, and how do you start playing that on your guitar? Well, personally, I prefer not to have music to look at. I prefer not to have something to depend on or have to rely on, like a chord chart um, or a like a tab. I never ever look at tabs. I never ever read sheet music anymore, right? I prefer just to have my guitar myself and be able to play whatever it is I wanna play. So some of this is going to involve a little bit of ear training and specifically within a particular scale, let's say the major scale, for example, you want to do some ear training and start to learn how to sing or at least hear in your head the notes of the scale. Now when you can do that, then you can go listen to a song of somebody who's singing and you can then know how to compare what the notes that they're hitting to the notes in the scale. And by the way, that's a good distinction to make by the way. When people are singing, what they are singing is the notes in the scale of the key that they're in. So if, you, if your ear isn't developed yet to a point where you can hear somebody singing and kind of pick out what they're doing in the scale, you can literally just do it the trial and error way first. You can literally just know, like look up the key on Google of whatever the song is 
and then play that particular scale, the notes of that scale, and then you can figure out, you know, by kind of trial and error, by listening to it, um, what a person is singing. But obviously it's better, in my opinion, if you, if you don't have to rely on that and if your ear is a little bit more developed because you have worked on developing it and you're able to hear the notes, for example, in a major scale and you know what key a song is in and you can listen to the, the, the rise and fall of the pitch of the person singing and match that to this, the notes in the scale and be able to play it on your guitar. The first step of that would be, well, three steps. First step would be do some ear training. Train your ear on the major scale to hear the major scale. Okay, you can do it. It does take effort. It takes effort for everybody. Just do it. It's going to pay off in dividends because it's going to help you. Just like working out in the gym helps you play any sport. Training your ear will help you play any music on any instrument. Okay, it's going to help you learn music better too. First step is to do some ear training. The second step is whenever you have a song that you want to copy the vocalist on, find out whatever scale they're singing in, and pick out little by little pick out the notes, the basic notes that they're singing. Don't try to do any vibrato, don't try to do any embellishments, don't try to slide the voice around like they do with their voice, right? Just hit the very basic cookie cutter notes. Once you have the very basic cookie cutter notes, the next step is when you add the embellishments, when you add the little trills or the vibrato, or you slide into a note, slide out of a note, etc. So that's a three-step process on how you can start um, playing what people are singing and really start to sound vocal with your guitar playing. Yeah, that's awesome. I um I used to play at a, a church uh, here in Franklin, Tennessee that did on Wednesday nights it was it was like almost all improvisation. Like they'd play a couple songs and then we just improv for a good hour or so. And I realized that they'd be pulling out songs. I'm like, oh man, what are they what are they doing? What? so I would sit down and practice learning my intervals. So like I would mm -hmm. you know, if we're playing in G, I'd be like, Okay, what does G to A sound like? What does G to C sound like? What does is, what is D to E sound like? And I would get used to that. So then when they would start just throwing out different chord progressions, I would be able to track better and and learn my, my you know, my, the melodies better. So um, ear training, that is, that's a huge one. Yep. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Completely agree. All righty, then last question. If you guys are ready for this one. You guys ready for this? You ready for this, Jonathan? I don't know. Should I be? <laughs> so, hopefully. All right. So Let's this see. one is uh, a personal question. Who do you find to be the most inspiring guitar players to listen to? Yeah. Okay. This is definitely a personal question, right? Um, this is all about what personally inspires me the most, what I kind of have liked to have played the most over the years. So I'll kind of, I'll kind of answer both of those. Um, I would say that when it comes to playing style, I would say there's maybe, I'll give you five. Five main ins inspirations or influences that kind of help me develop the way that I personally prefer to play. And before I tell you that, I want to say that it doesn't all have to be guitar players. And a lot of times I recommend that it's not. For example, one of my influences on how I play guitar is actually the way that Stevie Wonder sings. So the, the way that he sings, um, I'll give you an example. Stevie Wonder likes to do a lot of things where he sings a major third interval and then sings a minor third. And I love that sound. And what it, what I mean is, um, you don't I don't want you to think too deep, you know, if you're watching this and you don't know what an interval is or you don't know what a third is or whatever, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I just want you to listen to the sound that I'm about to make. Okay. So if I'm going to play some notes, can you hear that? Okay. If I play this note and this note, those are the first three notes in this particular case in, in a major scale. So just follow along with me. So one, two, three. Technically, this note here is out of key. It's the wrong note. But Stevie Wonder loves to sing something where he, he sings one, two, three, and then goes to the minor third, or the note one down from that, which is out of, out of key. So he'll go, he'll sing something like that. And I love that sound. So that's one of the, the you know, influences, I guess, that, that, that I like. Um, Another one is Pat Metheny. If any of you guys have heard Pat Metheny, he's 
definitely one of my top five favorite guitar players. I would also say, um, actually, you know what? Let me just share a little thing that I got from each one. How about that? It'll make it a little more fun. So with Stevie Wonder, it was the the, the major third, minor third thing. So it was uh, like that, playing the wrong note on purpose. And it's just really, I love that. So another one, Pat Metheny. So Pat Metheny, if you know who that is, uh, if, if you don't, you should, I, I think, in my opinion. Um, but Pat Metheny, man, he has so much stuff that he plays. But in general, I kind of developed a more, not necessarily staccato style, but a little bit of a... Um, a style where you're kind of like bouncing around from, from note to note rather than playing something smooth like this that's like more smooth Pat Metheny might play something that's like more like like to, kind of staccato or something like uh, something like that right it's a little bit oh kind of jazzy feeling but more contemporary so there's a lot of things that I could talk about with him so let's keep going let's say um, I would say Sean Lane if you don't know who Sean Lane is, again, highly recommend that you specifically look up. There's a concert from uh, Musicians Institute in 1993 where Sean Lane is playing a, a yellow Charvel guitar. Highly recommend watching the whole thing. It's absolutely incredible. One of the best guitar players of all time. Unfortunately, he died when he was like 41, I think. Super tragic. And this guitar, actually, I modeled it after his signature guitar. So one of the most amazing things that I got from Sean Lane was what he likes to do let me see how I can play this um, is that he will in music there's a there's a note called the major seventh in uh, a major scale so if I'm playing a major scale and if I play like a major seven chord kind of gives us that like a mysterious kind of vibe or if I play the scale is that note right there that one Kind of feels mysterious, like oh, floating, or, or you know, it's 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 interesting, right? So what Sean Lane likes to do, or like liked to do, is actually bend from the wrong note, which is right here. That's the right note. He would like to bend from the wrong note to that major seven, and it makes it feel like just super emotional. I'll give you another example in a second, but let's say we're playing this chord here. He might go. It's just like wow you know it just hits you you know but the way that he does it maybe we're playing this chord here and you might go he'll bend up to it right there this is the major seven he'll bend to it uh, let me see if I can do that again it's just very super super emotional and I just love that 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 feeling I guess um, but actually the first version of that that I learned playing the, the noticing the major seven note was from David Gilmore. So David Gilmore from Pink Floyd. He would just play the major seventh note. But for example, the way he would do it, he would just go, if he's, he mainly used the pentatonic scale, but he would play something, you know, just simple. And then he would just go to the major seven and just play it. And I got a lot of that from him like that just playing it right there it just gives you that same cool feeling but if I wanted to do it like Sean Lane I could do the David Gilmore part and then the Sean Lane part so what if I did this Some, something like that right um, speaking of which a lot of these ideas I can show you how to do them we have a course called the greatest musical ideas of all time from the world's best guitar players I put these musical ideas that I got from these uh, different guitar players and that these different guitar players do, like Stevie Ray Vaughan, etc., um, and show you how to use these musical ideas that you can use all over the guitar neck to start sounding like them and, and develop your own style as well. So that was four. Let's see, do I have a fifth that I can think of right now? I'm not sure if I do. Um, maybe I can't think of a fifth one on the spot. Who, who else, Brock? Who else do we listen to? guitar player wise I'll, I'll leave them I'll leave with those four for now so we got Pat Metheny Stevie Wonder Sean Lane and David Gilmore yeah why not those good. are some great players well I Let's think stick that's with a, that for now I think it's a perfect question to cap off the the whole Q&A because that was the first question that we had today is how do I become a guitarist like Eric Clapton or John Mayer 
There you go. And and those guys weren't try, they were trying to probably trying to be like someone else and develop their own style by taking all of these different techniques and you know these different styles and blending together. Uh, and I think that's just a great thing to learn. Like, don't it, you don't necessarily need to learn someone's songs front to back. Learn the different things that make them sound like them, and then make it your own. It's, yeah, totally. I got a fifth one for you. All right, come on. How about this? How about we add some BB King in there? That's it. So BB King or some blues, right? And just general like, I I grew up listening and learning how to play guitar with old school blues like BB King's first record. Um, Howlin' Wolf, John Lee Hooker, all that kind of stuff. So I can show you one thing that I got from those guys that they all copied each other, right? Um, there's a couple of things. One would be like a B.B. King thing where he would play the same note twice really fast at the end of a phrase. So let me see if I could make it up on the spot, right? Um, he might go and on this last note he might hit it twice like that. Something like that. Um, something like that. But anyway, um, another thing that he did that all those Albert King, those kind of guys did, right before the last note that you're going to play, you bend it a little bit. And it's usually um, on a note that you're going to... How do I say this? Usually if it's it only works, or you're only going to do this if you're going to end on a note that's closer to your body. For example, if the second to last note is this note, and the last note is that note, or the last note is this note, both of these notes are closer to my body. So on the second to last note here, I can actually bend a little bit, like that. And it doesn't sound good if I do it by itself, but I might go. It can sound a little nastier with your blues. See what I'm saying? Yeah, so that's what I got, one of those things that I got from them. So there you go. We got Pat Metheny, we got Sean Lane, we got Stevie Wonder, we got David Gilmore, and we got B.B. King and all the old blues guys. There's top awesome. five for you. I love it. That's my favorite question of the day. Awesome. All right, guys. Hey, y'all, thanks so much for hanging out with us for the last uh, hour and 15 minutes. You guys are amazing. Again, if you want to dive into some break, more Breakthrough Guitar and learn from Jonathan, there's a link in the description. If it's your first time here, hit the like, comment, share, subscribe, all those all those good things. And I'll start with an S. <laughs> yeah, right. Awesome, guys. We'll see you the next one in a couple weeks. So, all right, peace. All right, guys. See you later.